Baz Luhrmann's film titled After the King of Rock gives us a pretty accurate depiction of Elvis' life. From his early years through his rise to fame until his untimely death, his journey from Memphis was a spectacle to say the least. But just how historically accurate was Lerman's depiction of Elvis Presley, Colonel, and the life they lived? In this video, we'll be breaking down the top moments portrayed throughout the film into three categories. The bullshit, the gray area, and the accurate. First, we'll cover everything that was made up or completely dramatized. This section is the bullshit. Did Elvis meet Colonel Tom Parker at a carnival? The film's story begins when Colonel goes to the Louisiana Hayride and first sees Elvis. He's told backstage that Elvis is on the pop charts and that the country DJs are playing him too, and that black and white kids are buying Elvis records. That potential is what intrigues him, the broad appeal to an expanding audience. He also says in the film that if he could find an act that gave the audience feelings they weren't sure they should enjoy, he could create the greatest show on earth. As the sequence continues, they both go up on the ferris wheel and come back down confirmed partners in the entertainment industry. Now this entire opening is completely far-fetched with years being distorted. Now in real life, Elvis didn't meet Colonel Tom Parker at a carnival and Parker didn't convince him to become his client in a literal hall of mirrors. In fact, we learn that Colonel Parker wasn't even present at the show and wouldn't discover Elvis until the following year. By the time Colonel Tom Parker met Elvis, Parker hadn't been a carny in years and was already managing hit country music artist Hank Snow. Colonel Parker's assistant saw Elvis perform and suggested to Parker that he should take a look at him. Did Colonel enlist Elvis to join the army for public relations? In the film, Elvis is nearly arrested and taken into custody for gyrations on the stage. His manager, Colonel Tom Parker, decides it would be a good way to clean the performer's image and protect Colonel's real identity by enlisting him into the army. This is totally inaccurate. In real life, Elvis was drafted during Vietnam. He entered the army on March 24th, 1958, surrounded by the media, stating, the army can do anything it wants with me, emphasizing that he didn't want to be treated any differently than the man next to him. After completing basic training, Elvis was sent to Freiburg, Germany, where he joined the 3rd Armored Division. We should also note, most business relations between the Colonel and Elvis were quite opposite from the movie. Listen, this guy was no fool. Parker loved that Elvis was like a male striptease artist. That sold tickets. The only time Parker got critical is when the shows began to falter with drugs or erratic behavior on stage, but that was in the 70s. Did the Memphis show really end in a riot after performing Trouble? This entire scene was strictly for movie making purposes. He didn't sing Trouble at that show because he didn't know that song yet. It was written for his 1958 movie King Creole. The crowd was wildly enthusiastic, but Elvis didn't have to be pulled off stage early. There were concert riots though, most notably in Jacksonville, Florida. However, there was not a concert for which Parker issued orders to censor his artist's performance. Headlines about how lascivious early Elvis was sold concert tickets. Was Robert Kennedy assassinated during the taping of the 68 special? In the film, this serves as the impetus for Elvis junking the proposed Christmas finale. This also leads to him substituting with what was the hastily written If I Can Dream. Although it adds a lot of chills and drama to the scene, it all turns out to be Hollywood. Now in reality, Bobby Kennedy's assassination took place on the third day of of pre-production, June 5th, 1968. That was almost three weeks before the taping. The assassination, which followed the killing of Martin Luther King by one month, did affect Elvis, but it didn't impact the filming. These events were certainly catalysts that drove Elvis to be less concerned with recording hit songs and more politically outspoken. But the way they were depicted in the film was just dramatized storytelling. Was the Christmas special depicted accurately? Not at all. Though, the true story confirms that Elvis did shrug off Colonel Parker's plan to do a calm Christmas show and instead deliver a sizzling rock performance. However, the film would have you believe that it came as a surprise to Colonel and the network when Elvis came out in black leather and began singing rock songs during the show's taping. 
The entire scene is embellished so much that it's basically fiction. The idea that the production team would have built an entire set, pretended to stage a Christmas number, and then pulled a switch as the cameras rolled is one of the movie's more ludicrous inventions. We've now reached the gray area. These scenes are either unconfirmed or contain partial truths. Did Colonel cheat Elvis as badly as the film depicted? No. The rumor that Colonel Parker took 50% of Elvis's earnings is an exaggeration and absolutely not factual. However, a judge did rule in 1980 that Colonel Parker had defrauded the Elvis estate taking millions, so we'll leave it up to you to decide. Did the scene with Elvis as a boy really happen? A sequence in which a young Elvis peeks into a rural shack where Crudup is performing That's All Right in falsetto is more fanciful since there are no records of Crudup performing the song in that style. Leading off from there, we see a young Elvis peeking into a Baptist revival tent in the middle of a sermon. When he joins, the energy electrifies his love of music and rhythm. The true story confirms that he spent much of his childhood living in The Hill, a higher income black neighborhood in Tupelo, Mississippi. While living there, Elvis attended gospel church revival meetings where he was in fact inspired by gospel music. Was Priscilla Presley depicted accurately? Although Olivia de Jong's character was well acted, the portrayal was inaccurate. Elvis met Priscilla while stationed in Germany in 1959 when she was 14 years old. And by all reports, they did listen to a lot of music in his room, but it couldn't have been Can't Help Falling in Love. The song was not recorded until early in 1961 and released later that same year. Never mind the fact that the version of the song they're listening to is by Casey Musgraves who wouldn't be born for another 30 years. Her exit from the relationship was a little dry in the film as well. The drugs certainly drove their marriage down with him, but Lerman's depiction of her was certainly not a main focus. Did Elvis meet Steve Binder and Bones Howe for the first time in Hollywood? At the section of the film that takes the most liberties with what really happened, the Hollywood sign makes a nice metaphor for things that were once vibrant but have grown broken down and beat up. But that sign was not where Elvis took his meetings, and it's not where he met the two men who would become the director and sound engineer of the 1968 comeback special. In fact, the meeting took place in Binder and Howe's office on Sunset Strip. Did Colonel sign Elvis to a five-year extension with the hotel on a napkin during that first show? Almost. The Hilton did exercise its contractual option for a single return engagement along with a five-year extension the day of the opening. Colonel Parker drew up the terms on a pink tablecloth in the hotel coffee shop. An actual document was drawn up a few days later. Did Elvis fire Colonel on stage at his last international hotel show? In the film, Colonel's big selling point was the international hotel promising to cover the entire cost of performance in their grand opening. This never actually happened. Total payroll for the four week engagement was about $80,000 which Elvis paid. Toward the ending scenes, an onstage rant is shown with Elvis screaming and firing Colonel as the curtain is brought down. But the firing of Colonel Parker didn't happen so publicly. The scene is apparently based on a September 1973 show at the Las Vegas Hilton. Elvis did go into a mild rant during the final show in that Hilton engagement, but it was aimed at the hotel rather than Colonel, because the Hilton had fired a kitchen employee Elvis particularly liked. After the show, Elvis and Colonel Parker had a loud argument and the singer did fire his manager. Was Elvis in a hospital during the Altamont and Sharon Tate killings? Now this is one of the film's odder constructions. In the movie, Elvis is recuperating in a Memphis hotel for exhaustion when he hears a news report about the Altamont rock concert outside Livermore, California at which four people died. Someone else in the room is reading a newspaper whose headline says Sharon T and four others have been murdered, victims of the Manson family massacre in Los Angeles. Colonel Parker uses those events as a sign that the world is a dangerous place and Elvis should not travel outside the US. But the timing is suspect. There don't seem to be any records of him being in a hotel in December 1969 when Altamont took place. And Sharon Tate was murdered by the Manson family in August 1969. So that would have had to have been a four month old newspaper article about the Tate murders, which seems to be unlikely reading material. In reality, Parker had no passport. Therefore, he couldn't leave the country or keep a close watch on his performer. 
Colonel didn't trust any other promoter to take him. While on the topic of Sharon Tate and Charles Manson, don't forget to check out our video breaking down the historical accuracy of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood when you're done watching this video. In this next section, we'll be breaking down everything that is true. This section is the accurate. Did girls fawn over Elvis Presley like they do in the movie? While it might seem like it's exaggerated for the Baz Luhrmann film, girls went absolutely crazy over the King of Rock. Elvis was like nothing the entertainment industry had ever seen before. His good looks, tantalizing dance moves, and mesmerizing voice were enough to easily seduce female fans. His onstage behavior was over the top and never before seen by the public eye. Colonel Parker was right on the money when he mentions in the movie that Elvis was a taste of forbidden fruit. Was Elvis really forced to sing Hound Dog to a real Basset Hound? In the film, the humiliation of the moment on the Steve Allen show made Elvis defiant and unrepentant about the gyrations that had caused some to label him a menace to society. In real life, Allen did ask Elvis to wear a tux and sing to the dog, because he was trying to avoid the kind of uproar that had followed Elvis's recent appearance on Milton Berle's show, where his unhinged version of Hound Dog caused a sensation. And yes, Elvis was embarrassed by the performance. At his next show, which took place three days later in Memphis, Elvis prefaced his performance by saying, You know, those people in New York are not going to change me none. I'm going to show you what the real Elvis is like tonight. Was Elvis's taste as extravagant as displayed throughout the film? His desires hungered for it all, from private planes to pink Cadillacs and model sports cars. His fingers and neck were dripping in gold rings and jewelry. To say the king of rock and roll had a champagne taste was an understatement. The movie got this 100% right. Did Colonel really sell I Hate Elvis buttons? This is surprisingly accurate. Parker wanted to make sure he and Elvis made money anytime anybody bought something with Elvis's name on it. In fact, there were periods when the hate buttons sold nearly as well as the I Love Elvis ones. Was Elvis addicted to drugs? In conducting our Elvis fact check, we learned that he was addicted to prescription drugs for years. His addiction to opiates led to severe constipation for which he took laxatives. It's believed that Elvis was on the toilet at the time of his death, resulting in a heart attack. Elvis had a total of 14 different drugs in his body at the time of his death. Pathologist Dr. Cyril Wett blamed Elvis's death on polypharmacy, the simultaneous use of multiple prescription drugs at once. Dr. George Nicopolis had been Elvis's personal physician for a decade and faced charges of misconduct for the amount of drugs he prescribed to Elvis. Did Colonel Parker really exist? Publicly known as Tom Parker, Colonel was born Andreas Cornelis Van Kwok in the Netherlands and came to the US without documentation at the age of 20. After helping the governor of Louisiana, Jimmy Davis, with his election campaign, Davis bestowed on him the honorary rank of Colonel in the Louisiana State Militia. Parker decided to use the title throughout his life, and just like in the film, he became known simply as Colonel to many people. Did Colonel really have gambling debts waived by committing Elvis to a single Vegas hotel? This is sadly accurate. Elvis never knew how many shows he played free to satisfy Parker's enslavement to the roulette wheel and the craps table. In fact, Colonel didn't even have to go down to the casino. The hotel would bring a roulette wheel to his room. Alex Shufi, the executive VP of the International, testified that Parker was good for $1 million a year in gambling, but others think that number is low. With all that said, let's do a quick breakdown of just how accurate the movie was. We rank each movie on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the most accurate score possible. We score them in three categories, each on a scale of 1 to 10, then take the average of the three. First up, plot accuracy. We're giving a 7 out of 10. The film's plot is pretty standard following the life and death of Elvis, aside from the offshoots of certain scenes. For character portrayal, we are giving a 6 out of 10. We can't assume each talent was hitting their role perfectly, but they undoubtedly portrayed their characters very well. And lastly, for embellishment and exaggeration, we gave a 3 out of 10. Remember, the lower the number here, the more it's embellished. A majority of the movie's top moments were highly exaggerated for the sake of entertainment. So our final accuracy score is a 5.3 out of 10. 
Baz Luhrmann did say that he relied on historical accuracy, but with a slightly elevated flair, obviously. In the end, he did a great job directing and recruiting the cast and crew. And together, they brought this magnificent story about one of history's greatest acts to the silver screen. Don't forget to subscribe and share this video with an Elvis fan. Let us know down in the comments what movie you'd like to see us cover next. Thanks for watching.